Welcome to 6.5 on the Roads, continuing coverage of Supercomputing 2024. I'm Dave Nicholson, and I'm joined by a very distinguished guest from Dell Technologies, Chad Dunn. Welcome, Chad. Thanks very much. Great to be here. So we're going to talk about something. Uh, actually, the subject took me off guard a little bit because I thought that data didn't really matter anymore. Um, Chad, what I mean, can't can't we just use AI? Doesn't that solve all of our data sins? How's that for a softball question? Boy, that's uh, well, what a terrible question. No, data always matters. Data is the most important thing, uh, and we're lucky enough to store you know most of the world's most critical data on, on our systems, um, and they, and they trust us with it, which is an amazing thing. But in terms of, of generative AI, data matters a lot. Because you, you really need to think about the quality of the data that you're you're introducing to your generative AI to get to business outcomes, and if you you think of the old saying, you know, garbage in, garbage out. If you feed garbage into generative AI, you're not going to just get garbage out. You're going to get very expensive garbage out. So you really got to pay attention to what are your data sources, what's the quality, what's the lineage, how's it governed. You know, there's there are so many aspects to having a good data strategy before you have a generative AI strategy. Well, we've been hearing a lot at the at the conference about uh, Dell's AI factory. So under the uh, kind of under the heading of the AI factory, you open the doors to the factory and you walk in. What are we going to see there in terms of what you're doing uh, from a from a data perspective? We've heard the term data lake house. I want to hear what what that's all about, the Dell data lake house, but what are some of the underlying technologies that you're leveraging that you're bringing to bear specifically for AI? Well, if you, if you go into the covers and you sort of look at the at the AI factory, you're going to see a lot of really sexy things, right? You're going to see a lot of servers with lots and lots of GPUs. You're going to see really complex, really high performing networks, high performing storage, object storage. Um, and then you're going to see where the data comes from. You're going to see something called the Dell data lake house. And this is the product that we use to be able to extract the data from those enterprise sources and prepare it to be used by generative AI. Now, we've largely had a structured data focus for the data lake house before. Uh, we partnered with a company called Starburst, a you know, very key partner for us who, who produces a, a software product, product called Trino. And this is basically enabling us to do things like federated search and data virtualization. So being able to get at your data no matter where it is through a single SQL query. But we're starting to augment that and we're starting to move that into the world of unstructured data, starting with embedding something called a Spark engine in the data lake house. Got it, got it. So when people talk about Spark and Trino, uh, that duo, uh, has you covered for structured and unstructured data? Is that the idea? It's it's a it's two steps along the path, right? So Trino is very good at structured data, so you can point it at your transactional systems, at your databases, you know, and do a structured query to there, or you can copy that data into a centralized data store and use it there. When you bring in something like a Spark engine, you're able to ingest streaming data. Now that data could be from transactional systems, it could be telemetry from hardware, it could be from software, it could be from IoT devices, and that's largely what I would call semi-structured. So you're able to ingest that data at the same time and process it in real time. And as we move forward, you'll see us add more and more truly unstructured capabilities to the data lake house. So not simply just semi-structured data, but things like audio, video files, and other things. So I'm going to put my naive hat on for a minute here. Uh, under the heading of AI, we uh, there are a lot of different things that people do. Um, mm -hmm. You're talking about preparing data for AI. Are you preparing data for the fine training of models, or is this primarily so that it's ready to be retrieved by RAG with retrieval augmented generation, or both? Is this sort of a foundational thing that you do from a data lake house perspective upon which everything that we think of as ai rests is that what this looks like yeah it really is that foundational step uh, i find whenever i have a generative ai conversation with a customer it, it turns out a lot of the meeting gets consumed by talking about their data strategy whether it's you know discovery of data where it's stored what format it's in how it needs to be transformed where it needs to be stored i'm gonna give you a great example of what we do internally at, at dell uh, we have a, an AI initiative inside of Dell called uh, Next Best Action. And that's all about analyzing 
what's happening with our hardware in the field and what our customers are telling us when there's a service event where they need to call us or contact us. And so we're monitoring that telemetry, actually using this product, ingesting it into the Dell data lake, and then we're making AI decisions on what the next best action is to get to a faster resolution of the problem. And we're arming our customer support representatives with that data. So that, that is in terms of a RAG search. And okay. so we're using that data lake with that high quality data, which is the telemetry from our products to arm them to have that conversation. So there's a lot of conversation um, among the CIOs and CTOs that I work with. Uh, this, this question of, you know, shall we build it and hope that they will come? Or do we absolutely have to figure out exactly what we're going to do in AI before we make a move at all? Could could you work with a company that knows that for their for for example they know they're going to be fine tuning a model with their own bespoke data and yeah. let's say they in their mind they're thinking look and and by the way we're going to do this on premises because this data we don't want living off prem um, and uh, and we're not exactly sure how, what this is going to look like moving forward could you tell them that even if you don't know what the ultimate outcomes are that they're looking for, that at least you should get, you, they can get started on, on data hygiene and, and leveraging mm -hmm. this stuff right away. Is that, a, is that a reasonable step to begin instead of waiting to think you've got everything figured out to make any move at all? Yeah, look, uh, uh, generative AI will expose a bad data management strategy very, very quickly. And so it is important to get ahead of this. And you, you really need to consider, you know, your, your data management strategy before you even head down the path of, of generative AI. Now, I will say that you, know, you, you mentioned, you know, build it and they will come. What we're really finding with most customers is there's a line already forming where something needs to be built, right? We had a customer support organization who wanted to provide a faster time to resolution, who wanted to provide a better support experience. We had uh, programmers who want to write better quality code. We have marketing people who want to uh, generate content much, much more quickly. And they're sort of waiting for these tools and, and waiting for us to say, here is the, the Dell blessed uh, generative AI solution to be able to do so. And I suspect, in fact, I know that many of our customers are in that, that same position where they sort of know now what the use cases are and they want to know how to get there. What is the actual underlying storage look like in these environments, Dell provides a whole variety of backend storage solutions, internal RAID systems, external, uh, you know, uh, uh, block S3. Uh, I mean, pr pretty pretty much everything. What what is this? What does this look like? Is it a mix of all of the above? Uh, well, well, there's a mix, but I tell you, the real workhorse of the the AI storage uh, portfolio for the AI factory is, is PowerScale because okay. that's giving you the unstructured file storage. That's also giving you an S3 interface. Uh, and so that's the one that you really can't do without. And that's where we see a lot of value in, in using that with the data lake house for storage. And does power, does that in, in that case, are those power scale nodes, separate nodes that are dedicated to storage or are you, or is that software that's running on top of servers that are doing compute work along with storage work? What, what does that look like? It's, it's, it's more the latter. And, and the reason okay. being, um, you know, there is, a, there is a characteristic difference between something that is optimized to be a compute workload versus a storage workload. I mean, we, we've certainly seen, and maybe in the past been uh, victims or believers in putting compute workloads on storage. And that has never ended very well for really anyone that we've seen. And so what we tend to do is, put some of these advanced processing capabilities where it belongs, and that's on compute nodes. And that's where the data lake house is, is what it is. It's a, it's a separate appliance that sits alongside storage and does that data management function, um, does that federated search, does, the, um, does vector search, does semantic search outside of the, the, the primary storage. And we believe that's a better way to go because you're gonna wanna be able to flex the capacity of that data management software uh, in a much different way than you would the capacity or the compute power in your storage arrays. Okay, so even though it might look cool to see a picture of a Ferrari towing a uh, an Airstream or a boat, it's probably better to have a good old fashioned Ford F-150 or, or at least a, a device that's designed for the job. 
Well, if we're going to vacation together, we're taking your Ferrari if we're going to, care, <laughs> we're, if we're going to tow an Airstream, okay? <laughs> <laughs> this won't go up any hills. I think I think I think we'll be okay. So what what else do we need to understand about this concept of uh, because look we you know there was a time when um, we in the industry touted the value of of information you know being the next oil the next gold it's yeah. information data mining was all the rage data lakes were all the rage. If people have heard the term data lake, now you're saying data lake house. Be explicit. What's the difference? between those two concepts. So there's tremendous value locked up in that unstructured data. So you know, today, if we look at the metadata associated with say audio files, great. We know when, we, when it was created, we know how big it is. We know who modified it last, great. What if we knew more things about what was inside it? What if we could use a language model and GPUs to inspect the contents? Let's say it's audio recordings of a customer service call. What if I could tell What's a good call versus a bad call? What if I could base my training on good calls instead of bad calls? You know, what to do, what what not to do? What if I could convert things out of my video files? You know, what if I could search through all my my picture files and find all the pictures of cats, or find all the pictures of you know twenty year old Chad with frosted tips and say delete? You know, that would be big value to me and probably to to society. So being able to use GPUs and language models to inspect the unstructured data increases the value immensely. And so, you know, I, I think that as we start to add more and more unstructured features to the data lake house, to the data platform, we're going to be able to realize those, those features. It's interesting because, you know, we've been talking about unlocking the value from data for a long time. It really seems like we're there now. We've got the horsepower and the intelligence to do it. We've certainly got the capacity to, uh, to do it. Uh, it's uh, it's uh, it's mind blowing. Um, what do you see moving forward in terms of advances from a data perspective? Or if you think about what's going on now from a Dell Data Lakehouse perspective, uh, what you're doing with Spark and Trino at this point, uh, are there bottlenecks, things that you're looking to overcome? When you look into the next year, advancements that you're looking forward to, what what is the, what does the future hold from a data perspective? I, I think for us, um, what we're looking at is what are the limits of the of the data functionality we can place in the platform to start to inspect those unstructured files and to do interesting things with them. And the technology is moving, you know, again very very fast because we're on that sort of generative AI innovation cycle, which is you know faster than anything I. I think that I've ever seen, at least in my career so far. Um, so I think that really is the next frontier is, is getting into those unstructured files and gaining insights uh, from them. If, if you look at most of the market pro projections um, by 2030, the vast majority of AI inferencing will be on video files, not the, not the text files, not the things that we're used to today. So I think it's going to make us incredibly more productive. It's going to give us insights um that we didn't know we could get out of this out, out of this content and key point tell me if i have this wrong but it feels like a key point is this isn't our grandparents storage this isn't simply we have a place where we can securely and with enough performance store your data um, this idea of a data platform involves intelligence that can provide insights into, you know, going back to what you were talking about, structured data, yeah. fine, it's in a database and we had that power, but specifically yeah. on the unstructured side, the platform you're talking about is intelligent and it's, it's, it's pushing something up other than simply saying, here's the file, here's where it exists, yeah. or here's the block address, here's where it exists. So that's no, the key yeah. to what you're doing. There's value add there. It's an intelligent platform. Is that a fair way to characterize it? No, you're, you're absolutely right about that. I mean, the, the, the symbiosis between the data platform and the underlying storage technology is, is absolutely critical. So uh, you just look at some of the things that we've done just recently in PowerScale. So the ability to, to export the, the entire, entire metadata catalog so we don't have to go traverse directory trees to, to find things. Um, a robust S3 interface that notifies us of changes so we can constantly uh, hydrate the data lake and look for changes and be proactive as, as the data changes. Um, things like 
like um, open data formats for, for tables like Iceberg or storing things in, in a Parquet format. Um, these are the things that make storage arrays you know, smarter and more able to cope with the needs that we're going to see in generative AI going forward. And, and PowerScale is, is right there with us the whole time. Okay, so Dell's Data Lake House is not simply a storage array with gray Martha's Vineyard shingles hammered to the outside of it. It is actually something far more sophisticated. This is this is good to know. Uh, final thoughts uh, or uh, final new things that have come out around supercomputing 2024 that we need to make sure we know about. Well, look, you got the big news. The, the next big thing is the is the embedding of the of the Spark engine, um, which we think is uh, is a game changer for us. And I think as you as you watch our roadmap evolve, you're going to see more and more of those unstructured features that I talked about start to be uh, start to be realized. And um, it's just it's an amazing time to be in the in the data management space. Fantastic, fantastic! And to all of our viewers. Go out and make sure you know the difference between structured and unstructured data, because uh, it's one of those things that people get confused about all the time. Uh, for 6.5 on the road, continuing coverage of Supercomputing 2024, I'm Dave Nicholson. Thanks for spending time with us.